So having sent off this email and it has been wrapped up in a very, very nice format, you would actually know what's next for you because the next thing that you'd have to do is actually come up with your costing. First thing you get to cost for is like your pre-production. This is your storyboard and treatment and all the workarounds you get to do for what you need to do. Um, you get to cost for your camera package. This includes your camera lenses, um, cameras, diffusion, matte boxes, and all the stuff that within like the camera department. Then you put in your operator's cost, your director's cost, your DIT's cost. Um, if you have um, camera AKS such as monitors, cables, and other peripherals, you have to include them into the cost. The next thing you include into your cost is actually transportation logistics. You consult with your gaffer that's within your production company or your team or the gaffer you're hiring. And he's gonna to put together a team, a best boy, a couple of um, um, assistants, light assistants, and they'll put up a light package that's gonna be with some HMI, some C stand, some LED lights, some just depending or related to what the script may need you get. And after you do that, um, you actually cost for your generator and all the lights, um, accessories that you need, like black wraps, gels, fog machines, and other stuff. Then you have to cost for other things that are not related to like the technical, which is like your production manager, the production assistant, the production coordinator, you get. Then you also have to hire a grip. For your grip department, you would need a key grip and also your best boy grip that's actually gonna be, and some other assistants you get. Then they're gonna take care of all the things that are not electrical, um, related such as your light stands your dollies your sliders the tripods all other things that are not electric related that requires heavy lifting and rigging that will be under grip territory so when you do that then you get to cost the, the final bits of what you'll be costing for this is just a gross summary as i'm, as I'm rushing through them you get so get like cover more ground other things you get like cost for would be um post-production which will include your editing suits your editing your editor um, color grading, if you have a coloring suit, then you charge for that also. Um, music, music score, um, voiceovers, um, and the likes that are actually in post-production. You get, then you also cost for like um, archiving and storage, which like your hard drives you get to use because you get like three sets, one for backup, one for agency, one for client, and sometimes a work hard drive. But in the reality, they only buy two, which is real hard drive and backup hard drive. But you have to like get most of this going. When you're done, you turn over those to the agency because that's their property that they've paid for. You get. Then lastly, you would have to cost for the welfare of your crew. This includes um, employing a caterer to actually bring um, meal sets on set at two meals or three meals, whatever the case may be. You get. And all of this will be bracketed into the days of production that exist. So when you don't want all this costing, you have to send it back to the agency and there's now the room for negotiation, you get. Whereby, are these true costings? What does happen here? Are there places we can save on the, uh, is this, can this be afforded by the client? Are there places we can make savings? What can we move around? How can we move around? So you go about that conversation happening, sometimes it happens very quickly depending on the intensity of how the job is coming. So on the treatment, right, there are like several, things that go or that happens when it comes to like writing a director's treatment. Um, there's not much out there that actually put out the content on in terms of what, what the standard should be, but this is just my process. So first thing I open like with the name of the spec spot. In this case, it was the Hero Ninja treatment. You get, put your name, if you have direct relationship, put your logo somewhere. If not, and you're working for an agency, they usually like it when their logo is projected and not you. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, so the first thing that goes on your treatment is the script, right? In this case, um, we, I won't, I'm not going to read through the script just to not make this video long so you can pause and read through the script. So on your treatment, you have like the script where you actually break through the storyline and um, everybody gets aligned on what you're treating for and you're just not jumping into uh, the treatment right away because sometimes some persons on the production team may have not seen the script and they're just getting your document as this is what. So it's always very nice to be inclusive and always lead with the script first. Then you go on with your director statement. This actually speaks to your approach, what you intend to do or what you hope to achieve. It speaks to the intent of what you're trying to craft, you get. And you actually spend more time in, in, be, in being brief and concise as to how you intend to um, bring out the client's um, expectation because that's what you're working for, right? The entire end game is to be able to satisfy the client. 
put that and see how it all comes together in the entire vision you're sculpting. You get. Then you go into the next thing, which is your concept. Your concept um, speaks to your strategy, which you want to bring to the table in how you want to approach it. You get approach the script, where you're coming from, whatever peculiarities you think would work for the script. In this case, some of it was using split screens, at least for this very spec spot, and some of it was using um, um, transition cuts. You get, I mean, more cuts actually, and split screen was like at the heart of it all. And how we try to use um, various, merge various words that speaks to the vastity of the script. Then the next you get to speak to is the audience demographic, like who is this targeted to, you get. So because this helps you, the agency and the client align like, okay, these are the kind of people we are trying to target, which is why I am making these decisions and which is why you're documenting these things, right? And most of the time, you get to like, think of it like you're making a very nice magazine that you want people to buy, but it's going to convey information, which is the entire sense of what using designer treatment. So I'm not going to say put two or three images here. There's no formula. Just Approach it as though you're like the editor of Vogue magazine and this time you're presenting something. Now, the way it gets more interesting is when you speak to your visual style. This is where you now start calling out what you're gonna do in terms of I gonna like make it like vibrancy color, it's gonna be like it's gonna be like a film documentary, is it gonna have like uh, we're gonna shoot it um, dark and make it more and not like bright and lighting. No, are you gonna go vibrant colors, um, close up, dynamic camera movement, edgy transitions, um, fast paced cut. This is where all of that is going to be like summarized. You get the visual style. That's when you now start getting to the looks. When it comes to transition, um, if you're going to like work on that, because transition usually doesn't come up on every treatment. It only comes up when you have to like get the client to sign off of. This is what we are planning to do. Are you okay with it or not? Because you have to be critical as the executor of that spot. You get this is supposed to be a video though, but this spoke to like some of the transitions we used in the actual video when you actually get to check the entire video. Then when it gets to tone, this speaks to the emotion you are trying to evoke by using most of the things that are both and how it comes uh, or what it leads to, what it gets to leave the audience feeling when they are done walking through all of um, the entire journey in terms of the world you'll be creating, you get. Then you move to the next section where you discuss the edit pace. Is it gonna be like a place where you are going like two, two, three frames per second? Or is it gonna have like this slow ebbing move where everything's connected, nothing is rushed, you get? This is where you actually get to discuss it. So in various clarity, like in this case, we said the energy, the, the edit will be fast paced and energetic, mirroring the dynamic nature of YouTube, right? Quick cuts not lasting two to three seconds per shot and seamless transition between the split screen will maintain the viewer's engagement and, and excitement throughout the video. The pace allows us to showcase multiple verticals within the short time frame while keeping the narrative flow smooth and coherent. You can see how that is speaking to all that's going to how we intend to like cut it so now you're not treating for post-production so nothing is not accounted for everything is on the document whereby you're referenced you get then music the tone of music how's it going to feel is it going to be like heroic is it going to be like afro is it going to be like popping is it going to be like fast paced is it going to be like soulful that's where you actually put the summary of what you're thinking you get and also some imagery to drive the conversation then um you go through your shot list now, this is where things get a little bit more interesting because now you're going shot by shot because it's like an editorial shot list of what the cut should be like. Your editor should be able to get this document, read it, and put up a first cut that actually speaks true to what you're, you're trying to do. You get. When you've listed out all the shots you have um, or you intend to take, right, then you move into, um, you move into your storyboard. Now, the storyboard are like visual references of what you think that should be done, right? In your storyboard, you get like, it gets to like speak to what your shot list should be. So if this was like, in this case, we have like a landscape, you get, and you get to like see um, the imagery or a sense. Sometimes you could use found footage. Sometimes you could use generative imagery. Sometimes you could use um, shot deck. But one rule for storyboard I have found out is whenever you're pitching to Nigerian clients or general African clients, at least from my own experience, Stay away from using Caucasian imagery because somehow the client brain is just wired to think that that's film. That's like, okay, permit me to say the way their brain will think it. That's Oyibo. Oyibo will do it better. We've never seen you done Oyibo film. So this is like far fetched. You're reaching. You get. So most of the time, it's good when you use like um, 
storyboard drawings. It's great when you use um, um, images that speaks true to the people that you're representing or the populace that you're representing. It makes it a little bit more connecting. So why Shot Deck is a great resource and you can get all these music video frames and all this stuff, but by the time you start putting it, it starts making, it, it starts becoming a disconnect. It just becomes a beautiful, a beautiful lie. At least that's how their mind you process it, you get. I suppose if that was presented by somebody of a different skin complexion, I, I don't know what it is, but that's just the reality. So just so you know, keep that in mind. So yeah, you get to like come up with um, your storyboards that showcase what you intend to do and the client can tell you that, oh, uh, the frame at the background, can we put like something there and you'll be like, oh, okay, that's possible or you'll be like, oh, that's not possible or these are the conversations that can happen during the, con during the, um, the treatment combination. Like in this case, we had a conversation whereby they were like, the iPad that was opening the scene, they do not want that, they would like a phone right and not like a tablet for because like youtube you get apple is like they're like on two different lanes you get so we had to like alter that on the day of shoot you get so we also went forward like more split screens showing different scenarios of the shoot showing them what's possible you get and they could like make notes and be like oh okay um for example uh, the steam shot can it be a little bit more um steamy you get can we have the guy use the phone in the kitchen rather than this tablet so certain conversations like this could come up by the time you actually start um having um, um the com preparing your treatment you get and you go through all the shot leads that you would have for the entire storyboards and by the time you're done you have a um end frame in the end frame we had this was like the intended end frame i had for it but um, the, the client said, okay, can we populate it with more grids to actually show more diverse scenarios you get? So these are all the things that your storyboard helps clarify and put everybody on the same page to be able to set the expectation and um, the tone of it. And all of these are what goes into your treatment, okay? So doing all of that, right, then we can now get into a production plan and you could tell them, okay, this would take, we intend shooting this cast on this day or this cast on different days because what was the initial plan was that, okay, we get two um, um, locations that are very different and actually speaking true to this narrative, right? We shoot the guy in his own bit, we shoot the girl in his own bit, but the budget could not allow that to happen, so we had to collapse that into one location, you get. Having done that, what that helped us now do is now, okay, we had to be heavy on production design to find unique ways to vary the experience of each. You get train tricks like lights, um, props, set design to be able to like uplift the entire thing, which was what we now ended up doing. You get. So when you go there, when you give them a production plan, then you usually leave them a thank you note and telling them that yo, if you have any questions, I'm available to have this conversation, and you send this document off. Usually, what happens is. Two to three days, depending on the schedule of what the production is, or sometimes almost immediately within 24 hours, you jump on a call with the agency and you walk them through the treatment so that they would ask their questions and you align and make modifications. If there are any modifications, you have to do that before you work with the client. Then you have a second meeting with the client whereby you still get to present this entire treatment and you walk through one. There's a more extensive document which will include casting videos. Um, wardrobe items, props, and all those things from all the other departments they'll be bringing. They will also contribute and add it to your document. So this document that's about 28 pages gets to grow into something like 113 pages or even larger. And those kind of meetings could span from three hours at the very least to about five hours because everybody gets to go through everything and you have to like sit in through and also make notes and make changes. Sometimes if there are no changes from the document, then you cannot move into the production phase, which is, um, you've done your recce, you've done your scout, because sometimes there's also a back and forth. When you've presented, you go do recce, you find out the location does not work, then they have to update the location deck and you have to now present to what now speaks true of the new location and the realities you're dealing with. So that the client is always constantly aware of the value of their money that's been spent and everybody's carried along seamlessly. So when all of that is done and your treatment is accepted, then you cannot move to the execution phase.